Good afternoon, everybody. Ooh, well behaved, thank you. Um, that's really impressive. Uh, good afternoon, welcome to the um, BMA Great Hall. Um, and I'm Martin Stott, and I'm the chair of the William Morris Society. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you all to this um, joint event between CUSP and the William Morris Society. Um, the Society is pleased to be sponsoring this joint event as its subject matter is very relevant to a contemporary interpretation of Morris's ideas and practice. His ideas on how we live and how we might live, on creative work, politics, leisure, technology, conservation in the environment and the place of arts in our lives remain as challenging and relevant now as they were over a century ago. It's no accident that, there are, um, there, that one of the authors of the essay series that we'll be considering today and one of today's panel speakers is my predecessor as chair of the William Morris Society, Professor Ruth Levitas. And um, the Society has a stall downstairs where you can join or find a bit more information out about us if you're not already familiar. I'm sure you'll find today a fascinating and stimulating occasion and to kick off the discussion on the essay series, I'm delighted to introduce Will Davis, who will say a bit, a bit more about what they are, the structure of the, the rest of the day, and your participation and engagement in it. So thanks very much for coming. I hope you have a great afternoon, and we'll start. Well, thank you very much, uh, Martin, and thank you very much to the William Morris Society for um, co-hosting today's event. Uh, and I want to thank also my colleagues at CUSP for doing so much hard work on making today's event come together. My name is Will Davis. I'm a co-investigator in CUSP on a particular strand of work called The Meaning and Moral Framing of Sustainable Prosperity. And today's event is the third in the what's called Sustainable Prosperity Dialogue, which is a series of public discussions of the meaning of prosperity that is chaired by Rowan Williams and as you know Rowan Williams will be with us later this afternoon to give a keynote. Um, in addition to that as you probably know this today's event is also the formal launch for a series of philosophical essays that uh, will be available to you in hard copies later on this afternoon. Um, these are reflections on the meaning and moral framing of sustainable prosperity by six leading thinkers, philosophers, theorists, uh, and I want to just say a little bit about uh, uh, some of what those essays we set out to do by commissioning those essays and some of the main ideas that emerge from them. We're delighted to be joined this afternoon by five of the six authors who will be speaking on two panels over the course of the afternoon. Unfortunately, the sixth is John Bellamy Foster, whose essay uh, is perhaps uh, as relevant as any, uh, which it looks at uh, utopian visions of uh, work uh, in relation to William Morris's work. Um, uh, and that is, uh, also forms an important part of today's discussions too. What I think uh, I tried to do when I was thinking about the meaning and moral framing theme of uh, CASP was to recognize that in the long history of economic and moral thinking, it has been normal to focus on economic and moral questions side by side together, often the same philosophers, the same thinkers through most of history, especially if we go back to classical political economy of Adam Smith, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill. These were thinkers who were concerned by questions of distribution uh, and morality as they were by questions of efficiency uh, and instrumental uh, technical questions of how the economy should be run. And certainly if one goes back much further to uh, the dawn of um, uh, Western philosophy and the work of Aristotle and so on, the questions of how we run our economy and questions of the good life and the good society were utterly entangled with one another. And it's actually a relatively recent uh, phenomenon within uh, philosophical thought that uh, economics uh, set out to become a separate science of the economy, separate science of efficiency or of rationality, something that really only emerged in the late 19th century uh, and became increasingly entrenched uh, in, uh, in, in an increasingly mathematical science of economics over the 20th century. And I think that what, one of the things that we at CUSP 
can do, and one of the things that this theme can do, is to think about how we put these things back together again. How can we start to do uh, economic analysis, economic thought, while also taking seriously questions about virtue, of justice, of equality, of flourishing, and of the future itself. And what we set out to do in commissioning the six essays was to draw partly on thinkers who we thought their ideas were particularly urgent and relevant to questions of sustainable prosperity, also thinkers who were committed to public philosophy, to the understanding of, uh, of, of conceptual uh, argument within the public domain, uh, and had, made, uh, uh, had set out to do uh, uh, thinking about the nature of justice and of uh, uh, sustainable prosperity in the public realm. Um, but also to think about these questions from a range of different philosophical and moral perspectives. But what I think comes out of the six essays, and as you'll see, uh, these will be available later on this afternoon uh, by our, our six thinkers, um, there are really, I think, three important themes I just want to flag up at this stage uh, and, and which may uh, emerge more over the course of the afternoon. I think the first thing is to recognize that the economy is always already a space in which moral and ethical questions are, uh, are urgently being asked and need to be asked uh, in a wider range of ways. John Bellamy Foster's essay uh, examines work as a crucial feature of a fulfilled uh, and ethically rich life, challenging uh, what he sees as some of the um, uh, 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 visions of utopian socialist futures in which work is kind of eradicated by automation. He argues for a rich ethical vision of work and of labor as a key dimension of human well-being. Equally, Melissa Lane's um, uh, paper looks at professional ethics and the ways in which professions uh, hold an ethical commitment not just to their clients, as is the narrow uh, understanding of professional ethics and duty of care and so on, but that professions need to be understood as ethically endowed institutions uh, that exist within the broader public realm with a broader sense of, uh, uh, of the um, questions of prosperity, questions of justice, uh, and questions of the good life that professions uh, should uphold, not just on behalf of uh, the, their narrow domain of training and specialism, but that they, uh, part of what it means to be a professional is to be alert to uh, longer term and broader questions of ethics uh, and the impact of the economy on others. I think a second key aspect of uh, the essays, and I think this is a key aspect of CUSP's work in general, is the recognition that growth exceeds monetary valuation and sometimes exceeds measurement altogether. That questions of human uh, flourishing, questions of collective progress cannot be anchored purely in notions of GDP growth. This is obviously one of the uh, key arguments that CUSP seeks to advance via uh, the work of Tim Jackson uh, and others. Um, but that we need to start thinking about human flourishing and human, uh, 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 the expansion of human capabilities in ways that goes beyond the economic and perhaps even beyond uh, the quantifiable in certain ways. And in that domain, uh, Ingrid Robbins' paper uh, provides uh, a, an examination of what the capabilities approach, uh, most famously associated with the work of people like Amartya Sen, um, but she shows how the capabilities approach casts uh, valuable light on questions of sustainable prosperity to think about what an enriched human life looks like in ways that doesn't simply come down to questions of material need, material satisfaction, uh, a material uh, expansion of, 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 of wealth. Um, in a related way, John O'Neill's paper uh, is a critique of the idea of natural capital, uh, the idea that we can adapt uh, economistic concepts from the realm of the economy, such as the idea of capital as something that can be invested in and will pay a, a monetized return on that investment. John O'Neill's paper shows that we need to, uh, that this is not an adequate way of valuing what is most valuable about the natural world, and that we need to have an expanded vision of, uh, of value and an expanded vision of progress if we're to uh, uh, move beyond uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the struggles that we're currently in in relation to an unsustainable economy. And I think finally, there is, in contrasting ways, papers that look at the connection between the past, present, and future and try to expand and enrich our notion of prosperity such that it brings in partly past generations, but also future generations. And firstly, there's uh, Roger Scruton's uh, conservative perspective on uh, sustainable prosperity, which uh, makes a, a, a classical Burkean argument for uh, the importance of relating uh, the uh, values of, of 
the, of those who are alive today with uh, those of previous generations, but also of future generations. Uh, and secondly, uh, and very uh, pertinent to the themes of the William Morris Society, Ruth Levitas's paper on utopian perspectives. What can we learn from a utopian, from the utopian imaginary? Not just about the kind of society we want to live in in the future, but also to use the idea of utopias to criticize, to challenge, and to expand uh, our notions of what is uh, politically possible and ethically desirable in the present. So we're going to move straight on to um, the uh, opening panel for this afternoon's uh, discussions. Um, I'm now going to invite our first three panelists to come up to the stage, who are uh, Ufa Elbeck, Melissa Lane, and Ingrid Robbins. I'll just give a very brief introduction to our three uh, distinguished speakers this afternoon. Um, we're, um, f I was going to start with Melissa Lane. Melissa Lane is the class of 1943 professor of politics at Princeton University and director of the University Center for Human Values. She is co-convener of the Climate Futures Initiative, supported by the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies. And she was awarded a 2015 Fee Beta Kappa Teaching Prize at Princeton University, and as many of you will know, she is the author of a 2011 book, Eco Republic, uh, on lessons from ancient philosophy for contemporary uh, ecological thought. And she's the author of, uh, of, of the report that I meant, the paper that I mentioned, A New Professional Ethics for Sustainable Prosperity. We are also joined by Ingrid Robbins, who holds the chair in ethics of institutions at the Ethics Institute of Utrecht University. She uh, has in 2016 was awarded an ERC consolidated grant for the project Fair Limits, which examines the distributive rule that there should be upper limits to how many resources it is morally permissible to have. Her most recent book is Wellbeing, Freedom and Social Justice, The Capability Approach Reexamined. And as mentioned, her essay for the series is called Freedom and Responsibility, Sustainable Prosperity Through a Capability Lens. And then finally, we're delighted to be joined um, by Uffe Elbeck, Uffe is a Danish member of parliament. He is initiator of the Entrepreneurial Green Party, the Alternative, and a former culture minister. He is an entrepreneur, writer, activist, and motivational speaker. <laughs> Uffe Elbeck right. founded the School for Innovative <laughs> Leadership, Kaisel Piloten, in 1991. And during the last 30 years, he's been a vital part of Danish cultural life through his various committee memberships. So welcome to all three of you. It's a real uh, honor to have, be, uh, have you here today for this afternoon's discussion. Now, the way this is going to work is we're going to have uh, a relatively informal discussion amongst uh, the three speakers. Um, we're going to sort of see where it leads, although I'm going to kick things off a little bit. Um, and then after about uh, 45 minutes or so, we will open things up to the floor, which means that we will have um, hopefully about 45 minutes for um, uh, roughly 40 minutes or so for a uh, general Q&A with the audience. Now, I want to start by focusing on the question that I think is at the absolute core of a lot of CUSP's concerns and at the core of rethinking the meaning of sustainable prosperity uh, and bringing ethical questions into the domain of the economic. And this is the question of the relationship between material and immaterial satisfaction. Now, this is something which runs through a great deal of CUSP's work. It also runs through much of the essays that we've published um, uh, within this series. Um, but particularly, Ingrid, I think that this is something that comes out of your work on capabilities approach uh, and is explored within your essay on this. I was just wondering if you could tell us, it's obviously a, a huge philosophical and political question, but how do we begin to think about the relationship between material and immaterial satisfaction and what this might uh, mean in terms of, uh, uh, of, of how we think about economic progress as well? So if I can land yes. that huge question on you <laughs> to, to kick things off. Yes. So I think the first distinction which is really helpful for any discussion is between the standard of living on the one hand and well-being or flourishing on the other hand. So the standard of living is the material basis that we have for leading a good life. It's, you could either say your income or your house or your car or the stuff you have. And often um, governments, when they talk about uh, the distributive consequences of their policies, they focus on those things. They talk about purchasing power. What changes are there in purchasing power of the, of the population? But that actually is not, that's a very narrow focus. The broader focus should be on well-being, or the term you used, flourishing. And then there is a whole philosophical tradition looking at different understandings of well-being or flourishing. And the one that has become very dominant, and that has also become the one that's adopted in economics, is preference satisfaction, as economists mm. use it, or 
desire satisfaction as a philosopher used it. And there it is whatever you desire or prefer, to the extent that th those desires or preferences are satisfied, you have a higher level of well-being. And as we know in the societies in which we are, capitalist societies, our preferences are molded. So that's how, if you live in a materialistic culture, you also have many more desires for materialistic goods. So there is no, no the sky is the limit. Mm. There is no limit to what you can desire and prefer. So the alternative that people have been developing is to look at something like the capabilities approach. They're also closely related um, alternatives such as theories of needs or other objective list theories. And the idea there is that you focus on not so much on what people have, because that's seen as an input, but on what people can do and the kind of person they can be. So it's doings and beings. That's the term that Amartya Sen also uses. So for example, your health, your social relationships, whether you can uh, have a meaningful uh, activity in your life, those are the things that matter. And as you can see, those, many of those things have a material basis. For example, being properly sheltered, you need to have a house. But also many of those things are, are uh, more, uh, don't have so much a material basis, but have, for example, time as an important input. For example, um, spending time in nature, hiking, you need time, you don't need um, material resources. Or a very important one, um, affiliation, social mm -hmm. relationships, spending time with friends. And so the way this can connect to the agenda of CUSP and to the agenda of everybody who wants to move towards a more ecologically sustainable uh, future is by asking how can we, um, in the way we choose our own lifestyles, but also in the collective conversation about what flourishing is, how can we move towards giving greater weight to those immaterial mm. um, capabilities, those immaterial experiences and aspects of our being? Mm. And for the ones that are material, how can we change the underlying um, inputs, the resources, into ones that are less taxing on the environment? So, I mean, the, the immaterial, the way you're describing them, these are things that can be objectively known about. They don't, from what you've said so far, the, the ethical question of these things potentially could become, um, you could still have a science of these, of these immaterial needs and, 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 and desires, and, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, immaterial needs and um, capabilities. So, uh, so this is an interesting question. So for example, one where I think this would be, um, so for example, how loneliness, which is, an, an, so it's the absence of loneliness that's valuable. Sociologists can study these things. Mm. So the way we organize society, but also the way we make choices about our own individual lives mm. um, can lead to uh, less loneliness. But there, then there are ones that are, of course, trickier because they're only mental, mm. such as mental health issues is to some extent measurable, but we know there is mm. a big debate about, um, about those categories in the... Sure, yeah. Um, Melissa, do, do, does, does your own philosophical approach to these questions cast any, any, any different kind of light on this question of the, of the material nature of the economy with how to weigh it, but also how to distinguish it and to marry it as well to, to these immaterial questions? Or, or, or and when we talk about the immaterial, to what extent are we talking about things that can still be uh, kind of objectively known about, such as loneliness mm -hmm. or mental health? And to what extent do we need to open ourselves up to a broader set of philosophical questions about the good life and the nature of, of human flourishing? Yeah, wonderful. So let me begin by saying something, building on what Ingrid was saying in the capabilities approach, which has been so much inspired by Aristotle and the um, original pioneering work by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum and extended um, by Ingrid and others. And then I'll move on to say something about my own specialty, which is actually Plato, which I think gives us a related but slightly different take um, on these questions. So I think the first thing is um, Ingrid um, mentioned doings and beings. and one of the um, very striking themes in the paper, as, as you highlighted at the, in all of the six papers, as you highlighted at the beginning, is the importance of relating, um, relationships and relating, which in a sense is both a form of doing and a form of being, and I think that's interesting in itself. Um, 
Now, when we say, well, are, are relationships things that we can measure? I think there are certain important aspects of relationship that can be measured. And it's important to say that relationships can be negative as well as positive. So we're in BMA House, and there's been very interesting and important research on the stress that can come from being at the bottom of a relational hierarchy, for example. And I think that's an important thing. Relationships aren't always positive for people's growth and development. But conversely, um, relationships can support health in profound ways, and social isolation is one of the, I think, really serious um, challenges that our society faces. Um, the one feature of the capabilities approach is that um, it has stressed in trying to um, prov provide principles for public policy, it stressed the freedom to develop these capabilities because of not wanting to be too prescriptive. Yeah. So not to say someone has to be healthy, but they have to have the freedom to develop their capability to be healthy. And I think that is a very important principle when we think about public policy. But I also think if we're thinking about ethics more broadly, we might want to think not just about the freedom to, but what is the ultimate ideal. And that's what brings me to Plato. Um, so in my work, Eco Republic, which you mentioned, um, I thought I used Plato's ideas about social and psychological stability, so the way in which the city and the soul, in his language, can either stably reinforce each other or can undermine each other. So the way our private desires might undermine the maintenance of, of a kind of social order, which is, I think, the state we're in now. And, and I think in that sense, having a kind of ideal of individual and societal health, in Plato's terms, an ideal of its exercise, and not just the freedom to exercise it, but mm. the actual exercise, I think is mm. actually um, really uh, important. So in my view, that kind of stability, psychosocial stability, is, is part of what we mean by sustainability, and right. so of sustainable prosperity. Right, mm. that's very interesting, thank mm. you. Uh, Ufa, could I just, I mean, in terms of what you're doing with um, the alternative, how does this, what, what, what place does the question of the immaterial or of the well, yes, the, the forms of growth and flourishing that, in a sense, lie outside of the market, lie outside of consumption, uh, lie outside of capitalist forms mm -hmm. of growth. What, mm -hmm. How do you approach those kinds of questions in your, in your political life? It, it, it's super tricky and interesting uh, and daring uh, because uh, if, we, if we go down that alley, we have to question what, what is growth Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, do you as a politician and do you as a political party dare to stand on the floor in the parliament and say uh, our country has to go down mm -hmm. in material growth and economic uh, growth uh, and th that provokes the whole paradigm about uh, how do we organize uh, our society and uh, what does success mean and mm -hmm. what does uh, identity mean and uh, what is a cool life and what is not a cool life and uh, what is freedom uh, and so so immediately it, it raised a lot of lot of very tough and interesting uh, questions and uh, for, for me I, I'm totally totally sure about that we have to go out there and dare to say that our part uh, uh, of the world we have to to go down in material growth, uh, but if you do that, you have to also to give. If you if you take something from people, you have to also to offer something new mm -hmm. and interesting. Uh, so so you have to say, but instead of uh, spending more on on, on uh, con, uh, con consumption, you, your life quality will go up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, we have to accept that there has been a direct link between material growth and uh, life quality. Mm. But uh, when we reached around 1970, 80, some, some, something where, uh, around there in our part of the world, the life quality curve started to flatten out uh, and the material uh, curve just went up, 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 up. And uh, actually when I, I was listening to the ladies here on the, on the stage, I thought, was I uh, less heavier at the end of the 70s when I, d I danced to the music of Donna Summer <laughs> uh, or uh, when I dance today. No, I'm really, really happy when I dance uh, then and now. Right. And, and uh, actually, I think uh, that, that's actually spot on. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, what, 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 when, when are we happy? Mm. Uh, what makes me happy? When, what makes me human? When, mm. when am I most human? 
when I'm most me. And uh, I, I was at a conference in uh, Salzburg uh, half a year ago and uh, had a very interesting discussion with uh, a female visual artist uh, from Argentina who uh, did kind of a project in Argentina asking all kinds of people uh, all around uh, Argentina about when are you most you? Mm. And the interesting thing was that uh, three things came up uh, again and again. Uh, I feel most me when I'm in the nature. Mm. That was one. And then you can just check it out, you guys out there, to figure out when are you most you. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, one was uh, when I'm in, out in the nature, I feel really mm. connected. Second, uh, I, I feel most me when I do some creative, uh, when I write or when I draw or when I, I sing or uh, when I do stuff, uh, uh, creative stuff. Uh, and the last one was when I'm helping other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all these three things has nothing to do with uh, no. economic yeah. growth or material growth. But we have to accept that there has been a link, direct link between mm. material growth, economic growth mm. and life quality. Mm. But in our part of the world, that has uh, yeah. gone apart. Uh, yeah. And um, for me, there's no question that we have to ask what kind of economic model have to come after the version of capitalism mm. as mm. we have it today. I don't care about what name we'll give it, uh, but uh, I know that it has to live up to at least three uh, things. There ha has to be positive figures under both, not only the economic bottom line, but also the social bottom line and the environmental bottom line. Mm. That's the basic of the new economic mm. model. Yeah. Uh, and uh, of course, if you stand on the floor in the mm. parliament and discuss the next year's finance budget, mm. and you say stuff like this, people say you're totally mm. far out. Mm. Uh, but uh, but uh, I, we are, I think it's, uh, we have to, to challenge ourselves yeah. when it comes to how to understand growth. Yeah, because at the moment it's super boring. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, <laughs> a, a very uh, big thing. It, it, people are like zombies. Uh, we are like zombies. We, yeah. we live by consuming, but uh, mm. uh, people get more and more empty inside. Mm. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Yeah. yeah, if I can uh, pick up on two points of what you say. So I think the problem is that the mainstream um, of society, so policymakers, etc., they equate growth or GDP per yeah. capita with um, well-being. That's an old story. I mm. mean, the people here in the room have written books about this. Yeah. But it's still the case, despite mm. all the scientific and scholarly arguments that this was a mistake, that this was not, uh, GDP was not meant to track well-being, etc. It still has this power. So I do think that the economists and others who are on a track of coming up with an alternative that tries to bring in those uh, non-economic and non-material aspects that we need to support their work. And then the other thing you say is about uh, that we are like zombies. And I think it's, so among the people who live this very... I know it was a hard... No, no, uh, but, uh, hard but it's support, a good metaphor. I also think as a slogan we should say, let's dance more. I wish yeah, we yeah, could yeah. pick that up. But uh, regarding this, the people who, who just live this very um, materialistic um, um, uh, life. So I think there, within this group there are two subgroups. They're the ones who really want this. And that relates to the discussion we, ha we are having about freedom. So what do you do with the people who really want this? But there's also the group who feels they're trapped and who feels they can't talk about it because they believe that their peers judge them on those material yeah. uh, of course, standards of, course, of success. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, once in a while, you encounter somebody who either mentally breaks down or who trusts you and confesses that they really believe that what they're doing is valueless. Yeah. So that's why we need to have this conversation mm -hmm. Uh, in the public domain because people will feel they're not alone. There are people who work in, in, in capitalist companies who do, who, who do not want to have that life, yeah. but they feel they can't talk about it. No, but it's interesting because there are two things that uh, make really pe people really sad. That's uh, uh, when uh, they are ill or their work, mm. Mm. their job. Yeah. Uh, there are so many people uh, who is uh, not satisfied about their job position and they have the feeling that they're running in a hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, for me, the, uh, the, uh, 
we we see kind of a, a meaning a coll collapse of meaning, mm. uh, and and uh, and and people think that then okay the, we can buy ourselves out of that uh, situation, but uh, but uh, that's a, a totally uh, uh, yeah bankruptcy of meaning uh, in, on many levels in in our societies right now in our part of the world. Uh, yeah, I, um, I just wanted to kind of pick up on something that's come out of this discussion and but also change tack a tiny bit which is so we've, we've identified there's a question here about how to combine a different economic and moral vision with um, with, with some vision of freedom and in a sense the, the lurking threat here is of the sort of the technocratic response to this crisis mm -hmm. if it is a crisis which is to say these are not the values anymore these are the values mm -hmm. and we're now mm -hmm. going to um, apply those which was not at all what any of anyone has said but this mm -hmm. is the fear particularly when you think about the speed of a problem like climate change where action has to be fast action has yeah. to, is urgent it has to be done on a scale that is potentially far greater than any jurisdiction so this the, there is this kind of lurking threat of a kind of technocratic yeah. alternative to market values um, and I just wanted to kind of connect this now to, to some of what Melissa writes about in the in the paper on on um, professional ethics to think a bit about what is the nature of advice and expertise um, in, in, in relation to sustainable prosperity because in a sense unless we've got some idea of, 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 of scientific authority of, 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 and of, and of uh, and of advice that is capable of engage, engaging on the level of the ethical but also of respecting the autonomy of people which is I think one of the things that is going to be hardest in many ways in terms of getting away from a purely consumer led vision of, of value towards a different vision but without trampling on, on people's wishes and freedoms along the way. <laughs> Again, a huge thorny dilemma but perhaps you could just uh, reflect on, on some of these questions about professionalism and, and expertise in relation to this. Yeah, well, actually, I'd like to even pick it up in a, in the, even, even in a broader context okay, about right. jobs, um, uh, as Ufa mentioned, because um, it does seem to me that part of the question, I think what people have felt very stuck by is this thing that we're stuck in the social mm. order, we see that, and an ecological order, we see so much of it isn't working, but no one knows whose job it is to fix it, and mm. everyone is kind of waiting for everyone else. And, and part of that, I think, is the result of you know the sort of division of labor, assuming that good unintended consequences are going to come about, and then not knowing quite what to do when we see the bad unintended consequences that have also come about. And so I and so I want to look for that sort of meso level of mm. ethics, where it's not just the individual, although the, I think the individual level is important, and we might talk about that more later. Mm. We're not just waiting for government to act, though that's incredibly important too. But it's also about what can people do in the roles that they occupy within mm -hmm. society more broadly. And I focused on that in the case of the professions, which, are, which is, of course, a relatively privileged area, people with expertise and certain kinds of obligations. But I think one could also run that analysis more mm -hmm. broadly. Um, and, and so my thought is that really it's not enough to say, well, I'm just doing my role and in a kind of blinkered way, it's not my fault if the overall consequences and outcome of society is, is flawed. One has to say, well, what is my role doing either to contribute to those problems or what could it be doing in order to solve them better? And so I think that is an obligation yeah. that we each have within the roles that we occupy within the market, within the economy, you know, within society more generally as well as roles as individuals and as citizens. Um, and, and in the essay, I say that there are kind of three levels. So one is, given the existing norms of my position, am I leaning as far as I can in the, in the direction that's mm. going to be most constructive? Or am I kind of making excuses for myself? And I think this is something that applies to all of us. The second level is, you know, within the debates about the norms of my profession, can I play a more constructive role, take initiative, in order to change the norms of the profession so that it might become unethical for them to reproduce certain kinds of social harm. Mm. And then the third one, and I think this is where it picked up your question about expertise, the third one is a kind of debate about, well, what's the place of that profession within society more broadly? Mm. And there I think it's actually really important to say, whereas in the first two, a given professional is playing a kind of expert role. Professionals themselves are not the experts on what their role in society should be, or they're not the sole experts. Mm. And there, I think it has to become a real social dialogue where you're also listening to criticism from society that, you know, the way you've been practicing architecture or banking mm. or, or whatever it might be, university professing, you know, mm. is, not, is not adequate and, and needs to be rethought. And there, of course, one has expertise to deliver into mm. that conversation, but I don't think that one should have the last word on sure. what one's own 
role should be um, and if Does this imply a sort of fuzzier jurisdictional boundaries in some way? I mean, more, more permeable jurisdictional boundaries where people are less certain of exactly what their, their duty is in well, some sense? Well, that's a really interesting question. I think that's the challenge is yeah. that, of course, you know, there are legal norms and there are moral norms, and so there's always some play between those, and we're kind of wanting to push the moral mm. norms further and then get the legal norms to catch mm. up in a way. Mm. But I, but I do think that it is fuzzier in a way because I think on the moral front, you know, it is saying I'm not just going to hide behind my role as it stands. And I was very struck actually, um, one of the founders of DeepMind, which is an artificial intelligence company in London, um, made this remark, Mustafa Soleiman, a couple of years ago, I think, saying we just all go around this cycle of basically playing the institutional role we are in, dot, 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 and that has to stop. And that was really very much the sort of um, thing that I had been actually trying to argue for right, in, in, already in my book and also in this paper, that as I put in my words, it was um, there can be no role without a responsibility mm. for the whole. But it is tricky because, of mm. course, you can't do everything about the whole. You still sure. are in your role. Of course, you have you know, duties of care and um, clients and um, you know, mm. sort of um, bounded responsibilities. Mm. So it does leave it fuzzier, and it's a challenge, I think, um, that we that we each need to mm. face. Mm. Wilfred, did you want to come yeah. in on that? Yes, of course. Mm. I would always like to comment. <laughs> 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 anyway, mm. no, but but this is uh, this is really also interesting f uh, for me. Right now, I, I, I'm a politician. I'm a national politician. But uh, in the past, I was also an educator, and uh, I I founded a very entrepreneurial, social entrepreneurial education called the Chaos Pilots uh, uh, back in, in the beginning of the 90s, uh, 91. And uh, at that time we, we asked ourselves what kind of education should we have had to do what we did? And I'm not going to go deep into that, but, but we, we had this question, what, how can we uh, secure that uh, our young people are equipped uh, the right way uh, for the future which they are going to face? And uh, through that, uh, uh, we developed this uh, very radical uh, program. Uh, and it still exists, and it's super cool. I'll just say mm -hmm. it, it's super <laughs> cool. Uh, anyway, but, but we, we asked this question, uh, uh, what, what should these uh, people learn through the training? Uh, it's on a university level. And of course, they have to uh, stand solid on, on profe professional qualifications. Uh, of course, they should do that. But that's not enough anymore. It was not enough at that time, but it's not for sure not enough now. Uh, and we, we dif identified four other what we call competence area. One is uh, meaning competence. It's extremely imp uh, important for our young people to create meaning around themselves and what they're doing and uh, be able to understand what is happening. Then they have to uh, be very good at relationship competence, uh, how to to work together with people, how to solve conflicts, how to communicate. Then they have to, uh, for sure, uh, have uh, what I would call uh, change ca uh, competence, to adapt with change, and then action competence, actually to be able to uh, mm. get the idea into reality. Mm. Mm. The problem uh, still uh, in many educational institutions are that they're focusing on the professional uh, qualifications. And that's also what, uh, what people get hired on. Which education are you educated from, which institution, etc. Mm -hmm. But they get fired by the lack mm -hmm. of the four other. Mm -hmm. if, because if you can't create meaning, if you can't be a good colleague, if you can't adapt with change, and if you can't create results, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, your, uh, uh, your insight raised uh, this question. How can we create an educational revolution? Mm. Uh, and of course, mm. a lot of ins institutions are damn scared about mm. what would that mean for me as a professor or a teacher? Mm. Uh, wh wh what is my status in that new way of mm. learning, this new learning environment? Mm. And, and uh, I think that uh, if we are going and to be able to handle this, this very, very tough questions we're dealing with also in this mm. panel, we have to be much more entrepreneurial. Mm. Mm. And we have to understand that, that uh, if we, are, we should uh, be able to solve, uh, for example, the climate change, we have as a civilization to be so creative as you can't imagine, mm. and so entrepreneurial that you can't imagine, mm. and so uh, uh, 
uh, able to work together on such a high level mm. that you can't imagine and solve Can conflicts uh, mm. in, in, a, in, in a wise wise way. So uh, what you raise is, uh, yeah, it's, mm. so, uh, it's a mm. core question. How do we uh, educate ourselves, not only uh, when we go through our uh, public school system and mm. uh, universities, but also on the long run, yeah. how, how mm. do you, all you all you guys mm. out there, how mm. how do you keep up mm. your creativity and curiosity mm. and uh, uh, the ability to to Could be the change yeah. we want? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Melissa. Yeah. I was just going to, I think this is so interesting. I was going to just give an example um, from a, an environmental studies class that I was co teaching last spring. And it was interesting because it was a class on major um, environmental challenges. Um, and, but we pegged it, instead of just teaching about the challenges, we pegged it to the year 2050 when the students in the class now will be just sort of approaching 50 years old yeah. and so would be at the peak of their, you know, sort of, or, well, I don't know if they would be at the peak of their social influence, but anyway, they would have social influence at that moment perhaps. And the thought was really to teach the entire class from the standpoint of the question, what is my responsibility in facing these questions in the year 2050? And it was really, you know, we taught all the ordinary material that you would teach, but it was a way of framing it so that it brought out that question and put that at the forefront of what the students were asked to think about. So just a small example. Yeah. Yes, if I can just make two uh, observations on this very interesting uh, discussion. So. Um, I think, I think it's totally fascinating what you're saying about this uh, model, the educational model, and I want to hear more about yeah. it later on. But it also um, reminds me of the thing that, so this is an example, it's a, so, and I think what we need is to share more positive examples. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm struck by, uh, I have a 12-year-old son who keeps complaining that the, the children's news is only about bad things. Mm -hmm. He says it's always war, war mm. and, and and then I think he's right. Mm. So his whole, his whole worldview becomes there's nothing than misery and there's nothing we can do. Mm. So I don't understand why we're also not um, putting more uh, spotlights on the things that work mm. well. And I can uh, give concrete examples where somebody who did something good also went beyond his professional yeah. narrow duties, yeah. um, where that was an inspiration for me to try mm. to do the same thing. So I think the, the role model function, I don't think we should underestimate yeah, it, and we should also sure. publicize yeah, yeah. it. And then the other thought I had was that, um, so in this, you, you make this helpful distinction, Melissa, between uh, the government, the mezzo, and the individual. And what we see in the area of uh, sustainability is that at the mezzo level, also new types of collective action emerge. Mm. So collective mm. action may be a bit of an old fashioned term, mm. I don't know, but I think that's what we need. So in the Netherlands, for example, I, in my view, but not only my view, the most powerful actor now for environmental change is, a, a, I even don't know how to call it, it's a coalition. They're yeah. very entrepreneurial, yeah. they're called Urgenda, yeah. and they are ha influential 50, 50 plusers mm. Mm. who use their own professional networks to try to, uh, uh, to come with, with, with uh, programs of how change could be done, but they, for example, also sued the government a couple mm. of years ago mm. that they're not doing what they say in their own laws they should do. Mm. So I think that's also something mm -hmm. where we should look mm -hmm. at, at these new types of coalitions. Since, I mean, this is an interesting point, because I think, in a way, this brings us now into the realm of the, the practical and the political, um, and in terms of what institutions will be required in order to uh, pursue some of these uh, alternative visions of, 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 of flourishing and of, uh, 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 and of freedom, ultimately. And I just thought it, it might be interesting, just particularly in the sort of dark times we, we feel ourselves to live in a lot of the time, that, to do some of this kind of um, sharing of, 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 of hopeful, practical examples of this nature, perhaps even utopian examples, given the title of, the, of, the, of the, uh, today's event. And I mean, maybe we could just start off uh, with, with you. I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of things that you've, you do, you seek to do with, all, with, with the alternative. Um, but what, could you perhaps share with us one or two um, examples of the sorts of innovations that you think are viable 
are already happening or could happen within the next few years that would start to uh, push us into this alternative direction that you were talking about. You mentioned education in, in, in one area, but if we need this kind of entrepreneurship, this kind of creativity that you've talked about, what does that look like at the level of, well, policy, regulation, but also the development of new institutions? If that's, I mean, that's a, a huge question, but perhaps you could share one or two examples if, if you have any. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, where, yes, where, where do you, where yes, do you focus course, your... But, uh, yes, of course, but, but um, um, maybe I should uh, uh, just uh, say f uh, a few words about uh, what is the alternative. Yeah, and, sure, uh, sure. Because uh, I think it's totally unknown territory for mm. you guys. Uh, um, and of course, uh, uh, I'm speaking from a Danish-Scandinavian perspective, and I know that the reality in the UK is very, very different. Why did you vote it for leaving EU? <laughs> uh, anyway, anyway, uh, anyway, but, um, um, but uh, just, just to say that uh, uh, the alternative as a, a party and a movement, because it's much more than a, a party, it's a movement, it's actually a new political platform where a lot of interesting stuff can happen uh, on uh, was sta uh, started uh, back in uh, 2013, so we are really, really the new kid on the block, and uh, we will have uh, our bumps on the way. But but uh, but uh, we started uh, back in 2013, and I'm just saying, uh, I just want to tell a, a, a very short story about it because I, I, I had just stepped down as minister for culture in at that uh, present uh, government, the centre-left government uh, at that time, and. Uh, uh, was just an ordinary MP, member of parliament, uh, and uh, I was totally frustrated about uh, my own government and my own cabinet and started to yeah, express uh, some of my views, which was not uh, the most uh, diplomatic I, I, I could do, but uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I had this, uh, I, I really felt that uh, politics just, uh, yeah, it's fucked up. Uh, and uh, it's, um, I totally lost uh, the meaning of uh, being a part of the parliament and uh, that kind of uh, established uh, political system. And, um, and that uh, then a specific day, a May Day in uh, 2013, I, I was standing with two young activists and they said to me, hey, Uffe, you're not satisfied about what is happening uh, uh, at, the, at the parliament. And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm not. And, uh, uh, and then they said, uh, and I still totally re remember the situation. Uh, and uh, we're standing on this specific street corner in Copenhagen, just across where I'm living. And then they said, then why, why, why don't we just start a new political party? And I looked at them, and uh, we have a saying in Danish, 40 finished and fat. Uh, and I said, I'm not only 40 finished and fed, I'm 60 finished and fed. <laughs> no way I'm going to start a, a, a new political party and movement in Denmark because I've done a lot of stuff in my past, but no, I'm an old, God, I'm an old man, God damn it. Uh, I'll just uh, do my period uh, in, in the parliament and then uh, step down and then write some interesting books and sit on a stage like this. And no, 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 no. Uh, but then, uh, over the, the summer of 2013, I, I, I started to read some uh, books about what is actually happening econo economically and also environmentally and culturally and, and so on. And then, uh, and then I, at, at, at the end of the day, I, I said, I just have to do it. I have to try to figure out how to change the political DNA code of a parliament. Uh, and uh, I, I stepped out of my, uh, at that time, pa uh, former party and uh, was an independent MP for a period and then uh, went public with this new idea about the alternative. And uh, my ambition was to, uh, because I couldn't, first of all, I have grandkids, even if I'm a gay man, I have grandkids. So, I'm a complex person, you can hear it. Uh, 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 I, I, I had, of course, this uh, deep uh, feeling that I, I, I had to do something uh, uh, to, so I could answer my grandkids when they asked me the mm -hmm. question, why didn't you do something? Mm -hmm. So each of you, what would you uh, tell mm -hmm. your grandkids about what you're doing right now? How do you use your mm -hmm. uh, time and resources and knowledge and etc.? Are you the change maker uh, or not? Uh, on what side are you? Uh, Etc. So I had to do something. That was one thing. 
uh, but uh, the uh, other driver was that I couldn't accept that something which is so important, politics, are so goddamn boring. Uh, I, I had to try to figure out yeah. how to make politics uh, lively, engaging, mm. meaningful, fun, honest, real. Uh, mm. So uh, together uh, uh, with a, a small uh, group of people who were only s as many as around the table down there on the floor, we said, uh, could we really do it? And then uh, we made the first public appearance and uh, we said now we have established this new political party called the Alternative and uh, we want to change the political culture and we want to change the economic system and we want to save the world. Mm -hmm. Similar like that. And I think 15 seconds into that press meeting, everyone said this is never, ever, ever, ever gonna happen. Mm. And uh, that was the case uh, the next one and a half year. Every time, uh, time when we tried to, to tell about it, it said, all the established media, media said this is never, ever, ever going to happen. Mm. Uh, but we succeeded to, to get enough signatures and we uh, got on the ballot. And uh, in the national election, uh, June 2015, our first election, uh, we came in with around 5% of, of the votes. Uh, we were the, uh, yeah, the s s third biggest party in Copenhagen. Uh, and so everyone was totally taken by surprise. And, um, and we just came out of local election in November and again came in with really, really good uh, numbers. Uh, and we tried to figure out how can we move re representative democracy to uh, involved democracy. How can we establish a new democratic bridge between the uh, established power spaces and what is happening uh, in society? How can we uh, uh, create policy from uh, uh, below and mm. up? Mm. Uh, we have a saying, uh, politics shouldn't come from the top down or from the outside in, but, but from the inside out and from the bottom up. Mm. Uh, so we crowdsource our stuff. Uh, we try to work with uh, local communities and we, we have a, a really good uh, also a partner here in UK. Uh, so there's also right now an alternative UK. Uh, one of my good colleagues is sitting down there. Uh, but uh, but uh, how can we vitalize democracy as we know it today? How can we move from uh, a representative democracy to involved democracy? And this is actually, and then I'll close down. This, that we are in a very, very uh, difficult dilemma at the moment because we have to change the system at the same time as we have to protect the system. Mm -hmm. Because uh, right now there's a huge uh, pressure on uh, uh, the democratic in institution around the world mm -hmm. uh, with fake news, Trump, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to protect actually mm -hmm. our democratic institutions at the same time as we have to change mm -hmm. it. And, and that's a, a super complex uh, task. Mm. Uh, but uh, but uh, first of all, uh, what we try to do is to figure out how can we open up the the Danish Parliament how, how, uh, and the, uh, the, our city halls. How can how can we make it much more transparent? How can mm. we uh, 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 live coverage our political meetings uh, on Facebook? Mm. How how can we invite citizens into the discussion much earlier in the process? How can we? Uh, how, how do we dare to, uh, to be in the, these power spaces with our souls and the, yeah, yeah. I, actually, I've been dancing in front of the Prime Minister <laughs> one day when, when uh, I had the Q&A with the Prime Minister. So we, we had to make politics yeah. alive and, uh, and uh, real and with we're, human. We're hovering around populism almost here, but <laughs> yeah, but, but this is a term again, with very but, 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 mixed uh, connotations. Just, <laughs> just, just to end it, yeah. right now, uh, and I, I don't where, know where this <coughs> ends on a global scale, but right now you see two uh, distinct, uh, st distinct uh, tendencies. One is going to, uh, uh, towards a very uh, con uh, a national conservative, nearly fascist direction with Trump mm. as uh, the front man uh, you see it with the governments in uh, Poland and uh, Hungary. Uh, you see it uh, many places. Uh, uh, a strong man or woman who comes up with simple answers on, co on complex questions. 
then you have the other direction is uh, w where, where people actually try to reinvent democratic processes and go back to the local communities and figure out how can uh, we uh, yeah, involve democracy. And, and you, I'm not saying that Bernie Sanders was uh, the front man on this, but to a certain degree, yes. Uh, and you see it with Podemos in Spain, you see it uh, Syriza in uh, Greece, you, uh, mm -hmm. you see it with, uh, uh, for sure, also the Greens mm -hmm. here in, in, in uh, UK. Uh, how to reinvent uh, democracy. Sure. And these two uh, 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 movements are on a very delicate balance mm -hmm. right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it depends with, uh, it depends on you guys yeah. where, where it goes. Yeah. Uh, do, does anyone, I want to open things up to the audience fairly soon, but does anyone, uh, I mean, anyone have anything specific they want to come back in on about this in terms of examples of of, of other democratic movements from which we might be able to, to learn or? <laughs> well, I, I guess I, I, what I want to say is that I do think that it's really important to make the point that these changes in part have to come about through the political mm. process and through real political pressure <laughs> and power building. I think that is important. And, you know, I, if I have kind of a critique of my own earlier work, it was that, you know, I was sort of at, in this moment when one could have a rational hope that all the British parties back in the 90s or in the early 2000s had, su had supported the climate change bill, and so one could think this is now a new consensus, we're going to have action on sustainability, and, and so one could think, you know, perhaps we'll have a consensus about a new way of setting, of understanding what harm is, and a new way of redefining boundaries of um, the freedom of individual action and so on. And I think, you know, one has to say it may not come about entirely through moral change and consensus, it may come about through political activism, and pol mm. it, it will have to come about through political activism, political organizing, And a lot of super mm -hmm. interesting stuff is happening in yeah. the UK with the flat yeah. pack democracy and yeah. the people in yeah. Rome, and yeah. uh, there's a lot of... Uh, but even in the yeah. US, I mean, there, yeah. you know, one of my political science colleagues has done a study of different American states, and some of them have very similar demographic and other political profiles, yeah. and yet in one state there's been significant action on climate change, mm -hmm. and in another comparable state there hasn't, and that's explained by political mobilization right. and, and political deal-making, sort of enlightened yeah. negotiation strategies and so on. And I actually thought that was a very instructive thing to say that you know, a lot still yeah, rests yeah, in yeah. that space of yeah. sort of um, savvy and, and enlightened political action. So. And mm. ever to mm. sort of maybe not fight dirty might be putting it sort of too strongly, but but to be up for a bit of a I mean that so when you say mobilisation, there's a sense of actually this is kind of agonistic in some yeah. sense. Well, that's well. But, 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 but again, uh, again, yeah. it comes down mm. to people. Mm. Uh, mm. It's uh, really interesting, and uh, now I'm speaking for sure as a Scandinavian person because we invented the welfare state. You know that. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so, so if, if you go, uh, uh, try to track down the history of the welfare state, where did it actually start it? Uh, and uh, what was the driver behind it? And uh, it was not a big, big uh, political uh, strategy paper from the Ministry of Finance who did it. No, actually, and it's actually a very hopeful story. You asked for hopeful yeah. stories. That, uh, that Denmark uh, went uh, bankrupt in uh, 1813 because we were on the wrong team mm. against you guys. Uh, so we lost the war and uh, the British came and stole our army and all that stuff. And so Denmark went bankrupt in 1813. And uh, if that was the case today, all the guys from the Ministry of Finance would come out and say, we have to work more efficiently, we have to cut down, we have to all kinds of stuff. Mm. Uh, the whole neoliberal uh, approach. Uh, but what happened in 1814, that was the year when we decided as a, a, a society to invest in people, mm. that every kid w uh, would uh, uh, have free education seven years. And uh, I think that, 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 uh, that's a beautiful story that the whole country went bankrupt and one year later we decided to invest in the common good. Mm. And uh, out of that grew all kinds of uh, new movements, uh, uh, farmers co-op, uh, co uh, co-ops, uh, uh, workers movement, uh, all the, uh, and if you really uh, concentrate it down to one thing is that people are coming together in meaningful communities mm. to solve concrete problems. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, I, I think that that's, uh, that's really uh, the key DNA if we should be able to, to handle what we are facing mm -hmm. right now, that, that we're coming together in meaningful communities. Yeah, yeah one more thought on this, which is, so I agree that this is crucial, so uh, to have these um, movements from below, but uh, there are two things. One is that I worry that uh, many generations have forgotten yeah. how to also be collective, to engage exactly. in collective yeah, action, yeah. to be activists. So when I was a student, we all were activists mm. on something, but my students now, they're busy with um, their job set aside. Mm. And the other thought I have is that we shouldn't have one size fits all because the kind of, so you, you ask the right question, are you an agent of change? Mm -hmm. But you can be an agent of change in many different yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think there's not one model. So political pressure is one model, but you also have entrepreneurs who actually change the commercial yeah. system mm -hmm. from within. You have people who develop the visions. So you have many different types of uh, change you can try to, yeah. to bring about and they fit with different personalities. Mm. But I do think the question is indeed, what are you doing? Mm. And then pick one of those options and go for it. Totally. Uh, I know you want the, uh, <laughs> uh, the audience uh, involved, but I just had to one, make one comment. And uh, that is that, that uh, uh, if you think that politics is only what is happening when you talk about politics, mm. you haven't seen the big picture. Mm. Because mm -hmm. you, have, you have life politics, mm -hmm. which can be everything that we want to, I want to create a city garden, urban garden, or mm -hmm. I want to be involved in my mm -hmm. local community, blah, blah, blah. And then a little part of that is what is happening when it comes to traditional party politics. Yeah. And I think the biggest uh, uh, challenge for all political movements right now is that we have to speak both to the head and to the heart and to the hand. Mm. And most politics these days are head focused. Uh, it's very nerdy. Mm -hmm. uh, but how can we involve mm. politics from the heart and also much more activists uh, mm. through the hands? Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, we have um, about half an hour for uh, Q&A, so uh, maybe we'll bunch them in, um, in, in three questions at a time. And then if they're specifically for one of the speakers, please say that. Otherwise, um, we will uh, just assume they're for lots of people. Um, let's see, um, okay, so there's a gentleman there, and then one there, and then one in the middle. So first of all, just here at the front, just there, yeah. If so, there should be a mics coming, I think. And, yes. uh, uh, do you think uh, people are um, not engaging with the bigger problems of society, such as climate change, because um, we've been um, enslaved by mortgage and rent payments and people are, are too concerned about just basic livel, living rather than um, higher uh, thoughts. And then there was one uh, just to the left there on that table, that's right there, yeah that's it. And then there's one in the middle, it's all right sir, I've, got, I've seen you. Thanks. Um, whilst I think it's useful to analyse the good life and reevaluate our aspirations. I think it's also useful to analyze the bad life and reevaluate our expectations in particular about reevaluating poverty away from income based poverty or wage based poverty or job based poverty towards more needs needs based poverty and subsistence based poverty so that I can for example live with very little income, so stats would say that I'm in poverty, but I don't feel that I'm in poverty. Right. Which leads to the question of how do you manage freedom, equality and autonomy within a severely resource constrained world where resource availability means that not everyone is going to get what they want. Okay, thank you. And then there's a third question there. I hope you're <laughs> managing to keep these in mind. <laughs> yep, sure. Yeah, hi, my name is Alex Holland and uh, I help people find their purpose and create the visions to realise it and I especially like the themes around how do we make this whole world that we want to create exciting, desirable, to help motivate people's hearts and their souls as well as just engaging with this sort of rational part of their mind. 
And I think that Melissa had a really brilliant uh, tool there in terms of getting her students to look 50 years into the future. And hopefully they weren't just picturing these nightmare dystopias where they're linked up by wires to machines mm. being fed with protein soy mm. but the uh, but that's it for me is that I think one of the keys is so I'm starting a group called the Utopist which is about linking fiction writers mm. to create captivating exciting soul engaging stories that are set in futures which are experience and relationship rich but low in you know unsatisfying unedifying material mm. consumption and it's sort of like Star Trek, but for sustainability, and maybe less tech focused, <laughs> more fun, more parties, more sex. But the, um, uh, I would be interested from the panelists, and particularly you, it sounds like you're down in this scene, the, um, if there's about everybody, do you know any other examples of these type of like, these sort of like art collectives or writers groups or anything? Because I'd really like to look for other examples of people who try to do similar things, okay. Thank create you. sort of utopian humanist fiction. Great, thank you very much. So we have a question about, I don't know if it was specifically about housing, but the mortgage and rent are sort of uh, distracting us. We had a question about, is this actually a discussion about poverty? And then finally, can anyone provide examples of artist collectives thinking about utopian visions of sustainable prosperity? Why do we start with Ingrid? Okay, so um, the first question about whether people are, whether they can be concerned because they have daily problems to deal with. So I think we are talking about people, but of course the population is very diverse. So it's true that because of changes in, in, in the economy and especially increasing inequality, that more people who were in the middle classes are also increasingly getting into financial uh, worries. So I do think that there are people who have no, um, no scope to think about these long-term problems. But there are also people who do have, I, and that's where I think also the question about professional obligations comes in. So there are people who should think about those questions, about the long term, about the future, about ecology, and some of them are and some of them are not. So it's to those who are not, but who can, that we should make a kind of a moral appeal. Um, on the question about poverty, so actually, uh, it's, um, the capability approach does define poverty in a different way than the income matrix. So I'm happy to talk to you afterwards at the way this works. So the capability approach, if you say, I'm having a minimally flourishing life, despite that I have a certain uh, income level that's below the official uh, poverty line, then the capability approach would define you as non-poor. But it's of course difficult to uh, extrapolate from one person's situation to, to everybody else's. And um, because other people who are in the, who may be vulnerable for poverty, may have some aspirations to certain um, experiences or goods that require money. Um, but the question how to limit the resources, it's a very, very big question. The, my own uh, take on this is that we should really, and that's also when Will said I'm engaging in this research project, I think we should have the conversation about just having limits on what we can have. And if you would use that money, so the money of the, the surplus money that the ultra rich have, and also more of the money of the upper middle classes, you could rearrange society such as, as to have those better lives. That's what I'm trying to work on. Melissa? Uh, these are all very interesting questions. I don't think I can do them no, no, up just, any yeah. kind of justice. <laughs> um, I guess I'll just maybe tackle the one about freedom, though I would also note on the um, the narratives. I think it's it's great that you're engaging with that, and it's actually striking that a couple of the leading voices on climate change in the U.S. Um, Naomi Oreskes, who's a really important historian of science, and Dale Jameson, a philosopher of science, both of them have recently published um, co-authored fiction collections mm -hmm. of short stories because I think they got frustrated with using just history and philosophy. They decided that they needed to use mm -hmm. art as well. So, and of course, we're we're thrilled to be doing this whole event with the William Morris Society mm -hmm. and speaking to the importance of art in that way. Um, on the on the question of freedom. Um, you know, I think there are, there, it, it's important to remember that there are many different definitions of freedom in, in various mm -hmm. philosophical traditions. So the sort of easier answer to this in a way is to say, well, the liberal harm principle of Mill, we can still retain that. It's just that we have a changing understanding of what counts actually as doing harm. And so we still preserve our traditional understanding of freedom, but you know, we, that may mean that some concrete actions that were previously thought to be fine may no longer be. And of course, that would be decided through the political 
process, you know, so, but, but I think one can say, well, so on one level, we can do that. But it is also worth thinking about other philosophical traditions. So to take an extreme example, Stoicism, which would say we're only free when we're free from certain kinds of dependence and have a certain kind of um, inner autonomy. Now, that's a very extreme philosophy, um, but, it, but it, it, it does give us a very different idea of what freedom would look like. Notoriously, you know, the Stoics thought you can be free even in a jail cell, you can be happy even when you're being tortured on the rack. Now, you know, many of their um, people responding to them said, really, you know, really? I mean, it's, you know, it was, it was a counterintuitive, a counterintuitive belief, but I think it's still worth thinking about the idea that freedom from, from, from different kinds of constraints, different kinds of dependencies, um, actually there are, there are many different ways of thinking about that and we might want to recover a richer mm. repertoire. Um, there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and um, Sarah, mm -hmm. anything particular you wanted to respond to there? Are you afraid that I take all the space or what? <laughs> we want to maybe get another couple of rounds of questions in. So. Okay. Let's <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Um, one thing I want to, I want to plug a book which is cusp related actually, and Tim Jackson has a chapter in it, which is in relation to the third question, uh, a volume coming out in next month called Economic Science Fictions, which is a collection of essays and fictional accounts, uh, which Tim has a piece in, I have an introduction in, Harjun Chang and others, so a little plug for, mm -hmm. for that, and that's been kind of come out of some cusp work. But um, let's take another round of, um, of, uh, of, of, of questions from, from the floor. Can you put hands up, everyone? We've heard three men so far, and there's Five men have got their hands up. There's a lady <laughs> there with a the red uh, shirt. Oh, oh, there, sorry, yes, okay. So the, the lady in the red jumper, please. I don't, I don't know whether that's a good thing or not. Um, anyway, I'll take advantage when it comes my way. I'm interested in people's ideas about how we can reset values in society. Um, at an individual level, when I have conversations with, with friends and, and colleagues about how they've come to establish a personal set of values or a family set of values that we would regard as being perhaps closer to where we're trying to go than the norm, very often they can um, trace that change back to a major event in their lives. Mm -hmm. Sadly, you know, very often it can be related to a major illness in a family member, um, bereavement, um, sometimes it's a major shock in terms of job prospects and that kind of thing, forced redundancy, all that. So it seems to me that some kind of, at an individual level, often shock leads to re-evaluation, leads to a positive outcome. Mm -hmm. And we heard earlier this afternoon about that effect at a national level in Denmark. Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard that story before, but we had national bankruptcy, if I understood you correctly, followed by a very positive decision mm -hmm. made for the country as a whole. So does this suggest to us that some kind of beneficial shock might actually be helpful in terms of getting a recalibration of our values, and what might that look like? Mm, very interesting. Um, two, other, two other questions? Um, there's uh, a couple in the middle here. We just get there and there. Yeah. Yep, 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 that's... Which, whichever, those, those two gentlemen there. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, go ahead, go ahead, please. Um, a really exciting talk. Um, my name is Sean C. Amy. I uh, work for the Heritage Offshore Fund as a policy advisor. Um, my question is, are we tinkering around the edges um, on this idea of, of changing uh, humanity and understanding uh, the nature of prosperity? Um, while money and debt continue to define modern society, um, how much progress can we really make? And do we need to reconsider the role of money mm -hmm. and how it is used to measure human and, and environmental value? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what would that look like? Thank you. And then if you just pass it a few, uh, a chair or two. Oh, yes, sir. there you go. Yep, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Melissa, but perhaps... Um, Ingrid would also have something to say about this. Um, and that's, I was really uh, intrigued by your sort of Platonist idea that uh, it's important to um, exercise uh, abilities as well as have the capability for them. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what that means um, 
and especially to what extent it uh, uh, either is, is compatible with the capabilities approach, whether it's in tension with it, um, so, and what that means in, in theory, but as well as in practice. So we have three, and Ofer, would you like to start on this occasion? Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, where should I start? I think, first of all, I think we, uh, to the gentleman concerning uh, money and work, uh, I think we have to question uh, the way the bank system and financial system are working, how we produce money, the concept of uh, producing money. And uh, that's uh, uh, something we are working uh, very focused on right now in my own party to figure out how can we reorganize the bank system uh, in a way that, uh, that uh, which is meaningful. And through that, I think we have to stand up for uh, uh, basic income uh, that uh, uh, if we have to face the new uh, reality and secure a new kind of social uh, net under, under each citizen, we have to discuss about uh, basic income. And through that, that we lower the uh, work hours. Uh, when we, we went, had our, our national election campaign uh, two and a half years ago, we said we wanted uh, to have uh, only 30 hours work week. Uh, and everyone uh, went mad. How can you on serious argue for a 30 hour work week? We have to work more. Uh, we have 37 hours uh, work week uh, in Denmark at the moment. Uh, but we have to actually to raise these questions and figure out uh, to work less uh, and uh, live more. And uh, we have to question the financial system and uh, the concentration on, on capital. And uh, we have to discuss uh, uh, what is money and what produce, who, who has the right to pr produce money. Uh, super interesting, but also tough questions. And everyone who wants to be part of that uh, discussion, please come. Uh, I want your names. Um, and, and, and then just one remark concerning freedom. Uh, I, I have this uh, distinction between freedom to and freedom uh, from. Uh, and uh, that's one distinction. Another distinction is outer freedom and inner freedom. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, we, we, we have to understand that we need outer freedom to a certain degree that uh, I'm not afraid uh, or that if I get ill, somebody will, <laughs> uh, there's a, a, a good health uh, system, or if I want to educate myself, there's a good free uh, education system. All, uh, I, I have a bathroom inside my apartment, not... Uh, uh, something we share together, the whole uh, house, etc. That's all connected to outer freedom. But, uh, uh, but at least in our part of the world, we have secured that to uh, all together, so, so uh, uh, we have secured that. But what about our inner freedom? Uh, and that's part of the education system. Mm -hmm. uh, because how, how are we able, there's so many of us who hold back our life energy that we really don't really dare to say what we think or feel or the way to react. For example, we had a little ten, uh, t uh, tension uh, going on here when uh, you didn't want me to uh, uh, answer some of the questions. And I said, hey, do you really want me to answer? The, suddenly there was a little interesting tension. Now stuff is getting hot. <laughs> now it's starting to get real. And, and, the, and, and, the, the, and I think that that's what really uh, makes me really, really sad when I see people who for a long time has held back their own inner life energy. And uh, I know what I'm talking about because I'm a gay man, uh, so I know how much I withdraw my own life energy as a gay person uh, when I was young. And uh, I know a lot of other people do it, not specific concerning sexual issues, but, but that we are holding back who we are and we don't really dare to say what, how I see things right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, freedom to and freedom from, mm -hmm. and then uh, out of freedom and inner freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think, uh, uh, I think the good guys have to take back the, the, the discussion about freedom because at the moment it's the neoliberal guys who, who 
owns the label of freedom. And uh, I think in, I know I'm speaking black and white now, but, uh, but I think that uh, we have to take back the, the, the understanding about what, what freedom is. Uh, so it's a very, very important discussion. Thank you. Uh, Melissa. Yeah, so let, so let me try to address the capabilities question and then I'd like to say something brief about the shop question. And the money question is incredibly important. On the next panel, you'll, I hope, have that addressed because that is so central um, to John O'Neill's essay, um, among, among others. So, um, so on the capabilities question and exercise versus freedom to exercise, so in a way, Plato and Aristotle were really at one with the importance of actually exercising. I mean, in Aristotle's developed ethical vision, it is all about exercise and actualization. That ultimately is what we're aiming at. I think in the development of the capabilities approach, as I said, because the aspiration was to develop public <coughs> policy for broadly speaking, sort of small l liberal societies, I think you know, there, there was this important thought to say, well, we don't want to force people to have to exercise and so on. And so there was this emphasis instead on just developing the freedom too. But, you know, I do think when we're having this conversation about moral and social ideals, we have to say, well, would it be as good a society if everyone had the freedom to be healthy, but everyone was actually deeply unwell? You know, would that really be the good society? Now, you know, one way of thinking about that, there's all kinds of ways to try to bridge that gap without falling into a kind of um, really deeply problematic illiberalism. So, so one way that people have talked about a lot is kind of choice architecture, nudging. So you, how do you set the social default so you don't force people to do certain things, but you also encourage them and express perhaps a social valuation of people doing certain kinds of things. Um, uh, so I think, you know, that I, I would sort of look maybe in that space to say, I think we do need to have the conversation about exercising capabilities and not just being free to exercise them, but we need to do it in a way that, you know, respects mm -hmm. important um, um, traditions and, 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 and laws that, that, that define a sphere of free action mm -hmm. that we don't want to um, um, trample over. Just on shock, um, so I was very much moved yeah, yeah, by yeah, what yeah. you said about the you know, people resetting their values on a personal level, and, and I think many of us will have resonated to what you said about loss often having that effect on individuals in a profoundly positive way, in a way. But I do worry about appeals to shock in the environmental space on a social level, because actually there have been, I think, you know, for years, kind of, I've heard some people who just are so distressed by the lack of action on climate change, and people sometimes say things like, oh, well, you know, if there's a really terrible catastrophe, then we'll finally mm. get action. And I think actually my fear is that in that situation, you'll get exactly the kind of perhaps ill-informed, technocratic, mm. you know, un unequal action mm. that is not at all what mm. we most fundamentally kind of need. So on a social level, I think relying on shock <coughs> is, is potentially um, uh, dangerous. Mm. and you know, it's really important to try to get ahead of that curve if we want to have um, responses to these challenges that are going to be um, mm. more broadly based and, and more, more deeply considered. Mm -hmm. Ingrid? Yes, so I, I also like to respond to the two questions that Melissa responded on uh, capabilities. Um, so I spent the whole of 2017 finishing a book on the capability approach on which I worked for 12 years. And the good news is you can download it for free, for free or from the website of Open Book <laughs> Press. <coughs> and it has the answer to the question. And, the, and the, the answer is, well, it has a answer, my answer. The answer is that I think the capability approach, because of its two main, uh, the two main names attached to it, namely Amartya Sen and Martin Nussbaum, is seen as a liberal approach. But I think it's not purely liberal. It doesn't need to be liberal. It can be more soft liberal, you could even think of more uh, conservative or communitarian versions of, of capabilities approach, although there is a, 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 there is a certain, um, at a certain point you, you violate certain basic claims of the capability approach. There's also much recent literature on this that actually says that if you only have freedoms, you get into some sort of inconsistencies, that many of these freedoms at some point in life actually require exercising and sometimes also forces of sometimes playing coercion, sometimes nudging, etc. 
So I think the question to what extent you always have pure freedoms, to what extent you actually have the other opposite, which is coercion or things in the middle, is open. And, and in the case of, of climate change and ecological sustainability, it's a, a big one. Mm. Um, and the, the question about how to reset values in society, I think that's really, really, really key. Um, because now our values are set by the society in which we grow up, which is uh, advanced capitalist societies. And I, I recognize the, at the level of individual change that sometimes it's a personal shock. But there are two other thoughts I had. And one is, you can have um, choices that people make that are not a shock-like shock illness. But for example, engaging in volunteer work. So when I first studied economics before I studied philosophy, and I always said that I learned more from engaging in volunteer work as, as a student than from studying economics, because it brought me into contact with people I had no, I wasn't into contact with in my, as a student. And there is a thing we haven't discussed yet, and that is that we have increasing segregation in society between different groups of people. And for those reasons, I also think it would be good also to reconsider something like uh, a national uh, civil servi service to all young people, um, just to get more, to change consumers back into citizens. So because that's what has happened over the last decades, is that we have been coming to define ourselves primarily as consumers. Our students are often, they act as consumers, which is logical because you charge them huge fees, so how do they act? Well, they act as consumers. So I think there is also this question about how to change institutions and how to encourage people to take certain decisions. And one thing we could study this is also to look at how over time changes has ha have happened, but also how countries differ. So for example, some countries have certain in social institutions that may lead to different sets of values. And then you could use those to reset values individually and collectively. It's now gone three o'clock, so I'm assuming that we probably need to draw things to a close at this moment, which I'm sorry that for anyone else who had uh, questions they wanted to uh, raise, but uh, it's been a fascinating discussion, so I just want everybody to join me in thanking Uffe Elbeck, Melissa Lane, and Ingrid Robbins, and then we'll start again in half an hour.